Okay, so let's go over some items on the syllabus. So the first item is that this is co section two. Okay, so this is me, McCary. Okay, so I'm Dr. Brady McCary. I have a PhD in applied math, not just regular math. Okay, so then the very best way to get in contact with me is by email. Okay, and this is my office. So my office hours are these. I highly recommend you come to my office. Okay, because a lot of the questions I'm going to assign you for homework are going to be difficult and perhaps beyond the scope even of the lecture. And that's just going to be the way it is and you're going to be expected to do them nevertheless. Okay, <clears throat> so then most of the time on those questions I put the, the difficulty just beyond for the homework questions, just beyond what you are able to do. Okay, and most of the time it takes just a little bit of input from me. And then you say, oh, I see which direction to go. Okay, very good. Okay, so then <coughs> everybody was filtered through the registrar for the prerequisite, so we'll just skip that. The co-requisite is that you have to be en enrolled in two other sections to be enrolled in the lecture section. You have to be enrolled in a problem section and the exam section. Okay, so then you had to be enrolled in them. There's no way that, you, that you're not in that case. So you don't need to worry about that. But what's important for you to understand is that besides the normal meetings of the lecture section, this is the lecture section, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 11, there will also be a problem section which meets on what day? Tuesdays. It will always be on Tuesdays. And the exam section will always meet on Friday. However, what you need to understand is that the exam section meets three times this semester. Three times. There are more than, there are 17 Fridays this semester. The exam section will meet on three of them. Okay? Okay. Very good. So then, the textbook that we're going to use looks like this. Okay, so then, I don't care if you get the text or not. Okay, but I'm going to be using this textbook and <coughs> I'll be following its sections and its exposition somewhat closely. So if you think you're the type of person that likes to read a textbook, then you should get it. If you really don't want to get a textbook, I'm not going to fault you for that. Okay, however, it's all entirely up to you. So another frequent question that I get is, well, you know, the ninth edition costs $5 million, but the eighth edition only costs $12. Can I get the eighth edition? I don't care what edition you get and, or anything like that. However, if I say, you know, I'm talking about section 7.2, question number 34, then I'm talking about the ninth edition. Okay, I, but, okay, I'm not going to say, assign you anything that says, I want you to do. I want you to tell me the fourth word of such and such section on such and such page. Okay, nothing weird like that. Okay, so any questions about the book or its requirements? Okay, so then, there is a homework system that we will be using. For those of you that took have taken a math course before at UTD. It is not one, of, probably not one of the ones you've used before. This one is called WebWork. Okay, so one nice thing about WebWork is that it's free. It doesn't have any cost associated with it. Fantastic. Okay, so then, uh, due to technical problems that are not of my own making, but rather of the e-learning staff's making, we can't have a homework just yet, but we will soon and I will send you an email as soon as that uh, is posted. Okay, so then there, will, there is an online homework system, but it's not posted yet. Very good. Okay, so then the required supplies for this course. You need regular access to a printer and regular access to a stapler. Okay, you're going to have to print things off. Those will be homeworks and you'll have to fill them out and you'll have to staple them. Homework simply will not be accepted without a staple. You need to understand that there are several hundred students in this course and the TAs have lots and lots of stuff to do besides deal with you and your unstapled homework. So I have told them to reject out of hand anything that's not stapled. 
Okay. <clears throat> so, the required supplies, regular access to a printer and regular access to a stapler. The prohibited supplies, so I have found in my, in my experience it's very good to give a list of prohibited supplies. Okay, so then, <clears throat> you are not allowed to use anything on this list or anything like anything on this list. So calculators are not allowed. This is a math class. Okay, cell phones, not allowed. Okay, especially when you are having any kind of examination or quiz. Okay, having a cell phone out or a communication device of any kind whatsoever while you're taking a quiz or an exam will be immediate grounds for academic dishonesty, no questions asked. Okay, please do not commit academic dishonesty. It is a big pain for me and for you, mostly for you. Okay, a little bit for me. <clears throat> okay, so then we're going to use e-learning to conduct the course. And basically what that means mostly for your purposes is that the gradebook will be visible to you on e-learning. Okay, all sorts of information available to you there. Okay, so <clears throat> one thing that we will really use a lot is your UTD email. So then I will send you an email saying such and such an assignment is posted. Okay, and I'll send you a couple of these a, a week. Okay, so say, you know, homework, blah, blah, is posted. Take home quiz, blah, blah, is posted. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so then, now, I'd like to go from this mention of the email down to this little item here. <coughs> okay, right here, number four. Failure to regularly check and maintain your UTD email is simply not an excuse. Okay, so then I'm not going to ever do anything weird like say, okay, in 37 minutes there's a homework assignment due. Go. Nothing like that. Nothing weird like that. All the assignments are going to be due at regular times. Okay, but I am going to send you various information through the semester, and it's going to be timely. You're going to have lots of time to act on it. But if you don't check your email but one, three or four times a semester, you're going to miss it. And I simply don't care if you miss it. Okay, you're not going to be able to make anything up. Okay, so missing, missing a message from me is simply not an excuse. Okay, that's, that's tempered by reason, okay? If there's some kind of tornado, you know, and, and things are destroyed, okay, no one's going to be punished for some kind of weird natural disaster or family emergencies or things like that. Okay, so any questions concerning the email policy? <coughs> okay, so then, makeups. The makeup policy. The makeup policy is very simple. There are no makeups. So then unless you have some kind of very extenuating circumstance or you belong to a, an officially sanctioned university sports team or something like that, there will not be any makeups. Okay? I appreciate that all of you work, some of you work, and that's fine. Okay? But the fact of the matter is, is that you had to sign up for these things and therefore your schedule is clear. Okay? So on the next page, specifically some things about the schedule. Okay, so then, this always is really painful <laughs> to go over. Okay, there are three exams. They are on Fridays at 8 p.m. Okay, I'd like to go ahead and say for the first of many times this semester that I did not choose that. Okay, I am bound to it in the same way that you are. I don't want to be there Friday at 8 p.m. You don't want to be there Friday at 8 p.m., but I guarantee that I'm going to be there, and if you're not, you'll get a zero. Okay, I know that a lot of you work in various industries like restaurants and things like that, and Friday night is, is the best night for earning money, and I appreciate that. But these are scheduled February 22nd. That's more than a month from now. You, you can arrange your life to take that night off. Okay, similarly for the Friday, April 5th, and Friday, May 10th. Okay, so work is simply not an excuse to miss. So any questions about that? Okay. So here is the schedule. Now these sections correspond to the textbook, the ninth edition. Okay, so if you get some other edition, then you'll have to do that translation yourself. <clears throat> okay, so the sections aren't really so important because we'll, you know, we'll be lecturing over them. What's important for you to understand is these things. So. This is the week that we're on right now, week one. 
Okay, so week one, we're going to go over sections 1, 1, 1, 2, and 1, 3. Next week, we're on, and that's one section a day. So it's interesting to note that we're only going to go over two sections next week. Why is that? There's no class on Monday. And why isn't there any class on Monday? Because it's Martin Luther King Day. Okay, that's next week. Okay, so then there's a spring break. We won't do, be doing anything that week. Okay, and then this, this is the last week of classes, the 16th week. The 17th week is examination week. We won't be having any classes that week, but you will probably be having several, several exams and at least one exam. Okay, that one. Okay, so the next week, Monday night, you will have an, an online homework due. Okay, assuming that the e-learning staff get their act together. Okay. There will be a quiz next week. Is there a quiz this week? No, right? There's no quiz this week, but there's a quiz next week during problem section. A take-home quiz. So take-home quiz is just <coughs> university jargon for a written homework that you are not allowed to cooperate with others on. Okay, so then I would have just called it homework, written homework, because that would have been simpler, but the word quiz, as far as the university is concerned, means that this is not a cooperative effort. Okay? So then, there's a take-home quiz due next week. You, you will turn that in during problem section. Is there a take-home quiz due this week? No, no take-home quiz due this week. Okay, so then, the weeks will go like that. There will be a homework due Monday at midnight a quiz that you will take on Tuesday during problem section, a take-home quiz that you will turn in during problem section, and the weeks will continue doing this, blah, 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 until the sixth week where we will have an exam on Friday at 8 p.m. Okay, so is there any question the way the general rhythm of the course will go? So every, re every week, with the exception of this week, you will have three assignments due. Okay, and on three times you will have an exam. Okay, so the next week's assignments, the homework, the quiz, and the take-home quiz, they will all be over things that we covered this week. Okay, so then we're going to go over section 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3 this week. The assignments that you will complete next week are, due over, are over content from this week. Okay, so I'm never going to test you over content that I just went over. Okay, I don't feel that, as, a, as an instructor, I don't feel that's a useful, <laughs> a useful thing. Okay, so any questions about the general rhythm of the course? <coughs> okay, let's continue. Okay, so specifically, some things about the assignment. So there are take-home quizzes. So the take-home quizzes will be posted online. You'll download them, print them, staple them, and fill them out, and then turn them in during problem section. Okay, the take-home quizzes, understand the instructor's point of view of the take-home quizzes. The purpose of the take-home quiz is for me to give you questions that are difficult. Okay, so then all, I, I get all kinds of reviews about the take-home quizzes saying that those questions are very difficult. You need to tone them down, man. Okay, so then, no, they're not going to be toned down. They are difficult because they are designed to be difficult. They're not designed to crush you and they're not designed to be outside of your possibility or capacity, okay, but they are difficult, okay, so then just understand going into them, they are going to be difficult, okay, so then the homework, the online homework, that's the easy stuff, okay, you're going to log into the online homework server and each one of the questions is going to be mostly just an exercise in just, you know, like doing reps, like if you're, if you work out at the gym, you know, you know that you have to do reps, right, just, it's going to be just like that. Okay, you're just going to do a bunch of questions. Each one of the questions is going to be a very short task. Okay, the quizzes, the quizzes will be short written answers. Okay, so then there will be no kinds of multiple guess questions in this course whatsoever, right? No, no choose the best option, none of that. Okay, so then the quizzes will be taken during problem section. Okay, so the exams will be taken during the exam section, Friday night at 8 p.m., they will be very similar to quizzes. Okay, so then generally speaking, the most difficult questions will be take-home quiz questions. Okay, the take-home quiz type questions aren't going to appear on the, written, on the written exam. Okay, so then they would just toast you, right? And what would be the point? Right, there would be no point, and it's from the instructor's point of view, of doing that kind of thing. 
Okay, so any questions concerning any of that? Okay, so one new thing about this semester is the testing center. Okay, so the testing center is a large room, set of rooms that are in the basement of the library. Okay, so the McDermott Library. So in the basement there, they have a room. It has 150 computers. You go in there and you can take various assignments, both on paper and on the computer. Okay, so various portions of the homework and the exams are going to be completed in the testing center. Okay, there's a couple of reasons for doing that. One of the reasons is, is the university just bought this big expensive testing center and I've been instructed to use it. Okay, so that's one of the reasons. Okay. Another reason is because mm, there's a little bit of this homework that's nice but doesn't really get captured. Uh, capture everything that I want about it. So the homework is generally pretty easy and no one's going to watch you do it and the net effect is that a lot of students don't put very much thought into it and have their buddy do it or they pay their pay their associate to do it or whatever. Okay, so then you will not be able to do that kind of thing in the testing center. So in the testing center you can't bring anything in whatsoever. You can't wear a hat, you can't wear a jacket. You can't bring in your cell phone, you can't bring in your purse or your backpack or anything like that. Right? It's very big brother. Okay, 1984. Okay, so you go in there, <clears throat> you'll do some things. So then on the exam, there are a lot of boring questions that I simply don't want to grade and I don't want to assign the TAs to grade. Okay, and those kinds of boring questions you'll answer on the machine and the interesting questions you'll answer on pen and paper during the exam at 8 p.m. on Friday. Okay, so any questions about the way that's going to go? Yes? Ah, you'll do the homeworks in your own time wherever you wish. Wherever you wish. Okay, but at the testing center there will be no no anything. <coughs> okay, so now the last bit and this is important. So then attendance and participation. So we are going to be taking attendance and measuring your participation. Okay, so then there's a little bit of bolded information here. It says that if I find that you are not attending or not participating, then I am going to assign you an NF grade. Okay, so what an NF means is that is a signal to the university that you essentially are, are committing fraud, especially if you have taken any loans to cover the cost of this course. So if you're using federal loans or some kind of grants or whatever to pay for this course, and I find that you're not participating or not attending, I'm going to assign you an NF, and the university is probably going to revoke all of your financial aid. Okay? So, that being the case, all that that means is that if you attempt every assignment or just about every assignment, there's no way I'm going to assign you an NF. Okay? But I have assigned several NFs already to students who basically did one homework and then never came again. Okay, so then it is in your interest to withdraw from my course rather than receive an NF. It will be very bad. Okay, so are there any questions concerning that? Okay, there's not, much, there's not too much wrong with failing the course, getting an F. But there's a big problem with receiving an NF. It will be very unhappy. Okay, so then now the grade scale, right here, it is the usual thing. Okay, so then if you at the end of time score a 96.66 or better, you will receive an A plus, et cetera, blah, 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 blah. So then I reserve the right to change these, to change these fences, okay, but only in a way that would benefit you, right? So I'm not going to make it more difficult to get a B minus, but I might make it slightly less difficult, okay? <clears throat> any questions concerning that? Okay, so any questions concerning any of this business? before we start going over new material. Yes? We are not using WebAssign. Ah, so that's a good point. And that is that uh, the text at the bookstore, you know, one of them comes with WebAssign, one of them doesn't come with WebAssign or whatever. We're not using WebAssign. Okay? In 2417, we're using WebWork. Okay, so any questions concerning any of that? Yes, okay, so then you, okay, so that's another thing, I'll just mention it now. 
and that is you will be assigned a randomly generated username and password for web work and the purpose of that is is to make sure that your academic records are anonymous to any third party right so you're gonna have some random username that's not associated to you in any way okay, no one will be able to figure out that you got question number seven on homework eight correct or incorrect or whatever <clears throat> and all of that will be given to you in a timely fashion and we're not going to do anything weird like <laughs> there's a homework assignment due in 37 minutes go nothing like that <clears throat> okay any questions okay so then the last bit is just something just about myself so then I typically am reviewed highly in this course so that's good okay, so then I I, I I think I do a pretty good job in, in running this show, but I'd like to point something out that many students mm, sort of get the wrong impression about, and that is I'm a friendly guy, and I am, I am very much for you, and I want you to achieve the very best grade you can, and I want you to do the very best job I can. So I'm friendly, understand that, but I am not your friend, okay? So please come to my office hours if you have any questions. Okay. So now, okay, we're getting used to this thing here. So can everybody see this? Cool. This will be my first time. So let's try this real quick test. So how, which one looks better? This or this? Second one's better? All right. So this is math 2417 section 2. Okay, so now we're in section 1.1 in the text, and it is called a preview of calculus. Okay, so just one little note that I'd like to say in your academic career, and here's this symbol here, right? It's not really an S. It looks like that, right? Un un an unpronounceable sim symbol, right? Where do you look this up in the dictionary? Is it in the S's? I don't know. At any rate, this means section. Okay, so it wasn't until I was a graduate student that I figured out what that meant. Okay, so I'm just going to let you know now. It means section. Okay, <clears throat> so then, now, calculus is the study of what happens when you take Mm, the normal everyday operations that you did in algebra, like adding things, and you say, all right, instead of doing finitely many of those operations, I'm going to do infinitely many of those operations. Okay, so then it should be weird. So here's an example. Mm, if you take two numbers and you add them together, you get another number, right? Every time, every single time you do that. What if you take uh, 10 numbers and you add them together. Do you get another number? Yeah. What if you take a really, really big amount of numbers like, like 42 numbers and you add them together? Do you get another number? Every time. Now what if you take infinitely many numbers and you add them together? Do you get another number? The answer is sometimes. Sometimes you get another number. But not always. Right? Not always. So humans love this kind of system where you take two things of the same category, combine them, and you get a third thing of the same category. You take two numbers, combine them, you get a third number. Fantastic. Right? You take two cats, combine them, more cats. Right? Excellent. Excellent. But the book is still out, right? What if you take infinitely many cats and you combine them? Or if you take two cats and you combine them infinitely many times, is the result a cat? Well, perhaps that's a little bit too philosophical for a... For a math course. Okay, so then we're going to be taking operations and doing them infinitely many times and seeing if we can make sense of them. Okay, <clears throat> so 
Here's an example. <clears throat> okay, so I'm getting used to this writing system. It's sort of weird, you know. So, so under, kind of understand what I'm doing here. I, I'm writing on this thing and looking over here, so I'm not looking at what I'm writing at. So my handwriting is should improve <clears throat> as the semester keeps going. Okay, so here's an example. Okay, so I'm going to draw two axes. Two functions. Okay, and these are supposed to be the same function, okay? I know that they don't look exactly the same, but that's just the limits of my artistry. Okay. <coughs> So the now, we, at each one of these places, we have a value. X is C. And at X is C. So then, here, this function, could you plug in, could you evaluate this function at C? Yes, you could, right? You just plug it in, and you figure out what F of C is. Okay, could you evaluate this function right here? Can you see when I'm moving that dot? Yes. Could you evaluate this function at C? No, you couldn't. But in a sense, these are, these are exactly the same function. What is the only difference between the two? Right, it's like, it's like I, I took the original function, I made a copy of it, moved it over here, and deleted one point. So I just, I just removed one point. So in a sense, you might say, well, that function it's really just kind of, it's just missing a point is, is what the deal is. It's just missing one, right? I can see that some guy just came by and, and took one point, right, and spirited it away. Okay, so then, in a sense, you can't, this function right here is telling you that, okay, well, if I plug in, if I plug in, I should get something y is equal to l. But this function, you can't plug it in. Okay, but nevertheless, with your human eyes, you can kind of look at it and say, well, you know, if I was to just take my pen and just fill in that hole, then I could plug in and I would get y is equal to L. Okay, so you've been doing this kind of thing a little bit in college algebra and pre-calculus and things like this, but we're going to formalize this notion okay, in this class, and the formalization of this notion is called limit, and that is one of the things that we're going to do is sort of coming by and saying, well, that function is sort of broken in this way that I can see with my eyes, so I'm going to mathematically fix it in a certain way with something called limit. Okay, so that's one of the things we'll be doing. Okay, and the way, th what this has to do with infinitely many steps, is that the way we're going to do it is we're going to say, okay, okay, if I'm right here, right, if I just get just a little bit away from this problem, x is c, then I can say, well, I'm getting kind of close to L. And so then I'll take one step closer, but not be at that point, not be, not be at X is C, but I'll take a step closer. And I say, oh, okay, I got a little bit closer to L when I did that. Okay, so then you take one step, two steps, three steps, you keep getting closer and closer and closer to L. So then you take a million steps, you're starting to get pretty close to L, but why stop at a million? Right? Why not just take infinitely many steps? Right, what would happen if you took infinitely many steps close to C? You would arrive at the Y value L. Okay? So then there is an infinite procedure involved in doing this computation called a limit, and that's one of the things we'll be doing. So any questions concerning that? Okay, I haven't done any computation here. I'm just sort of waving my hands a little bit, saying what we're going to do. Okay, another example. <coughs> Another example. Okay, so two, two axes. Okay, so then now I'm going to, on the first axis, I'm going to just draw a straight line. And on the second axis, some kind of curvy line. You'll notice that every, almost every function that I draw will look like this, right? It sort of goes up and down a little bit. Okay, so then now, this is a line. This is just a straight line. The kind of thing that you've seen so many times before. OK, 
okay so then I don't have purple how about pink can you see pink no that's too close to red how about green no how about this green it's like Christmas okay now if I call this right the rise the green part the rise of the line and I call the red part the run of the line if this is the rise and this red part is the run then what what word am I trying to get you to say when I'm talking about rise and run here probably slope right so then this line has something associated to it a slope right the slope the slope is this is not a math formula this is just an abuse right slope is what over what rise over run Okay, now, how about, how about this function at this point here? So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say, for some reason, I'm going to, at this point, attach a line, right, a single line. It's going to look something like this. So then, for some reason, I'm saying that this line that I've attached to the function represents the slope of that function there. Right? So then, what do you think? Why did I attach that particular line? So how about this line? Do you think that this line represents the slope of the function? That doesn't seem like a very good match. Right? That doesn't seem like a very good match. Let's try again. How about maybe this line? Is this a good match? No, that's not a good match. All right, so you just sort of go through there with your eyes and say, okay, well, I'm going to eyeball it a little bit and say, well, it looks about like this line. Okay, so this line is a line which has the same slope as the slope of that function. Okay, so then the slope, we're going to figure out how to compute this slope. <laughs> slope is, we'll just say, magical right now. So then, how do I make it give me a new page? Like this? Yes. Okay, so then the way we're going to do it, the way we're going to do it is like this. So I'm going to make a copy of that same function. Okay, and I'm going to say that, well, that this is, this is the point that I want. Right? I want to find the slope of the function at that point. And so the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to say, well, this corresponds to some value. And I'm going to take another point. I'll make a green point here so we can feel like Christmas in, the, in January. Take another point. And now, now that I have two points on this graph, right? between any two points, I can draw a straight line. right? So then that's one of the things that you learned from from whatever course, algebra, I guess. Right, so then this, this is not a very good representation of the slope. I want the slope here at the red point, the slope of the graph. The pink line is not a very good representation of the slope. So what, what's one thing I could do to make the pink line be a better estimation of the slope of the function at the red point. I could move the green point. Right? If I move the green point right, a little bit closer, a little bit closer, then that would make the slope a better estimation. Right? So for example, I could take the green point and move it half the distance to the red point. And then the resulting line would be a better approximation of the slope of the function at the red point. Right, so I could, I could take the green point and move it half the distance. And that would be better. So then from there I could move it again half the distance, right? two steps. And then it would be better estimation. And then again half the distance, three, three steps. 
And I could do a million steps, and that would be pretty good. But why stop at a million? Why stop at a million steps? Why, why not just take infinitely many steps? If I take infinitely many steps, then those two points are no longer going to be different. Right? Which is interesting, because I'm going to attach a line at a point. Right? Just one point. This thing that I've drawn here is easy to understand, because there's two points. There's two points, and you can always draw a line between two points. But what if I just give you one point, and I want you to draw the line between one point? And so then, what's going to happen is we're going to allow these points. We're going to take this green, line, green point and move it with infinitely many steps to the red point, And the resulting line is going to be something important. Okay, so any question about this? Okay, so this is another infinite procedure we're going to consider in this class. Okay, so, not this, not this, okay, the next one. So any question about this? Next. Okay, so another thing we're going to do, another thing we're going to do is this. So what if I give you this shape? That is a really straight line. Can you believe how straight that is? Wow. Okay. <laughs> it's hard to be up here. And it... <laughs> She's too kind. Okay, so then <clears throat> I'll call that measurement B and that measurement H. Okay, so now this is supposed to be all of these things, all of these segments meet at right angles. So what's the name of this shape? Rectangle, right? So then, by definition, by definition, what is the area of this shape? BH, right? Fantastic. Okay, so what if I take the same shape, the same shape, and I, I do this to it? So, so this will be B, and this will be H again. And now I'm going to mix it real up, up real good here like that so that this is still a meeting at right angles. Okay. Now this is no longer called a rectangle. <laughs> right. What is this one called? A triangle, right? Okay, good. So then <clears throat> what's the area of this shape? 1 half BH. Very good. Okay, so these are things that you should have known before you got to this class. Okay, so now I can take this and make it just slightly more complicated and say, well, this one and that one and that one and that one. So this will be, this will be H1, this one over here will be H2, and this will be B, and this is still, these are still meeting at right angles. So, what's the name of this shape? Trapezoid. Right, trapezoid. You got two uh, sides, it's a quadrilateral, it has four sides, two of them are parallel, two of them are not parallel, such a thing is called a trapezoid. Okay, so then, what is the area of a trapezoid? Ah, right, this is another thing that you should have known before you got here, but most people forget this one, right? So it's one half, one half the average height, H1 plus H2, multiplied by the area of the base. Okay, so notice, notice that the two previous, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, no, no. Go away. Okay. So then, the two previous shapes, rectangle and triangle, those are just special cases of a trapezoid, right? Because a triangle, right, a triangle is just a special case of a trapezoid that has a degenerate uh, H2, for example. H2 has height zero, right? So the triangle is just a special trapezoid, a degenerate trapezoid. Similarly, a rectangle is just a trapezoid where instead of having two sides parallel, all four, you, the, you have two pairs of sides which are parallel. Okay, so then this one is more general than these two. Okay, so then the one that we're going to do, 
the one that we're going to do is even more general than a trapezoid, right? So then what it's going to be is we're going to take, we're going to take the three sides of, of this kind of trapezoid, and then on the top, we're going to put some kind of fancy hat, right? Very fashionable hat, like so. Maybe just some kind of function. Right, so then this shape, right, this shape doesn't have a name, right? The previous shapes that we dealt with, they have names, right? Rectangle, triangle, trapezoid. That shape, it doesn't have a name. But you can agree with me when I say that it has an area. Right? It has an area. It has an area. So if this right here, if this is x is a, and this is x is b, then the way that we will recover this area is with a formula. And so I'm just going to write down the formula, mostly just for entertainment. The area of this shape is mathematically written in this way and pronounced like this, the integral from a to b of f of x dx. So understand that this shape doesn't even have a name, but nevertheless it has a formula for its area. And understand that this shape that I have just drawn is more general than a trapezoid, because all the trapezoid is is when instead of taking a fancy curved hat like the one here, it's just a straight hat, right? That's all the difference is. So this one is more general than a trapezoid. So this, right, a triangle is just a special case of this example. Rectangle is just a special case. Trapezoid is just a special case. Okay, so we're going to learn how to do this. And the way we're going to do it is really sort of fantastic. <coughs> so the way we're going to do it is like so. We're going to take this shape, okay, so now what I'm going to do here, I'm going to try this here. I think I can draw straight lines with, with this ruler, no, this, this, okay, so then I'm going to take this, oh, look at that, fantastic, okay, so then this one. Okay, I'll try, I'll try and start using that more often. Kind of looks like a third grader up here. <clears throat> okay, so then now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to take a rectangle and draw it under the curve here. Okay, and another rectangle and draw it under the curve. Another rectangle and draw it under the curve. Another rectangle, draw it under the curve. Another one under the curve. Okay. So then now, sort of fill this in. So I, under this curve, I made what? Five rectangles. So I could find the area of each one of these rectangles. Right? There's just five of them. I could take out my ruler, I could measure the base and the height of each one of those rectangles, there's five of them, and add them up. Right? The area of each one of those rectangles is a number. Can I add up five numbers and get another number? Yes, that's something that we established before we got in this class. So now, if I was to use these five rectangles as an estimate for the area under that blue curve, would I be making an overestimate or an underestimate? An underestimate. Someone explain to me briefly why. Right, because these little bits, I'm not getting this little bit, right? That, I just overlooked it. And I just overlooked that bit and that bit. So I used five rectangles. So someone give me a strategy on how I could make a better estimation. Okay, I could use trapezoids, I agree. But I, instead, I want to use only rectangles. More rectangles, right? I use five rectangles. It would be better if I used seven rectangles, right? I make a better estimate. Right? And then an even better one would be 7 million rectangles. Right? Because each one of those rectangles would have an area, and that would be 7 million numbers. And can you add up 7 million numbers and get another number? Yeah, sure, no problem. But why stop at even a finite number of rectangles? 
So the way we're going to define this area is we're going to say, OK, let's divide it up into infinitely many rectangles. OK, now each one of those infinitely many rectangles has an area. And now the question is, is can you add up those infinitely many areas, those infinitely many numbers, and get another number? And the answer is sometimes, right? The answer is sometimes, okay? and not always. Okay, so then generally speaking, when you have an operation that has infinitely many steps, you can ask the question, does it make sense to perform these infinitely many steps? And the answer is invariably sometimes. Okay, if you consider, if you consider all possible functions and you try and cut them up in this way with infinitely many rectangles, generally speaking, the answer is no, you cannot do it. Okay, in this class, the answer will almost always be yes because in this class, this is a walled garden where I always give you questions that have answers. Okay, the wider universe, most of the time, is not that way. Okay, so then, let's review a little bit. <coughs> so then, this first thing right here is evaluation. Right? Evaluating a function. How are we going to evaluate a function if it doesn't have a value there? And the answer is we're going to use a procedure called a limit. And the limit is an infinite procedure. Okay, we're, going to, we're going to take infinitely many steps, get closer and closer and closer to the point that we want to be at but isn't there. And then we're going to say, well, we got infinitely close to y is l, so the limit is l. Okay, it's a procedure of infinitely many steps. Okay, then we have this notion. And the notion is that, well, lines have a slope. And this graph, well, it's not, a, it's not a line, but it does appear to have a slope. Okay, and the way we're going to get at that is we're going to say, OK, I want to compute the slope at the red point. So the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to take a green point and put it pretty close to the red point, and that's two different points. I'm going to draw a line in between them. And that line, that line has a slope. And it's a pretty good estimate for the slope of the graph at the red point. But it's just an estimate. So I can make it better if I move the green point closer to the red point in one step. That's a better estimate. Okay, but why take one step? Take infinitely many steps. And then after infinitely many steps, you should have a line that agrees with the slope of that function exactly. Okay, a procedure that has infinitely many steps. Okay, finally, we made these you know, comments about shapes. Right? You know the shape, uh, the area of the shape called rectangle. That's something that you should know. Okay, similarly, triangle, trapezoid, and then we have this shape. This shape doesn't even have a name. It doesn't have a name. Okay, nevertheless, it has an area. Okay, so then the way to come at this is to say, well, I'll cut, I'll cut the area that I'm interested in into finitely many rectangles, or generally any shape that you know, like trapezoids. You could use trapezoids. It, we're going to use rectangles because doesn't matter, right? If I use trapezoids, the answer would be exactly the same. Okay, so then cut it into finitely many rectangles and then say, well, now let's let the number of rectangles become infinite. Another infinite procedure. And we're going to see, when does this make sense to do this procedure? Okay, and that more, believe it or not, I have now covered all of the topics we are going to talk about in this class. <laughs> okay, now for the rest of the semester, we're just going to talk about the fine details. Okay, so any questions concerning those things? See you on Wednesday. <clears throat>